Conference Room, 5 Minutes, 10 Illustrated Essays About the Office, written by Shea Serrano, illustrated by Arturo Torres, read by Kevin O'Connor. Meeting 1, The Basketball Scouting Report. First, this is a basketball scouting report. It features all of the players who participated in the basketball game from the fifth episode of Season 1 of The Office, between the office workers, hereafter to be referred to as Michael's team, and the warehouse workers, hereafter to be referred to as Daryl's team. Michael's team was made up of himself, Ryan Howard, Jim Halpert, Dwight Schrute, and Stanley Hudson, with Phyllis Lappin coming in off the bench. Daryl's team was made up of himself, Roy Anderson, Lonnie Collins, Madge Madsen, referred to by Michael as the East German Gal, and Jerry, the old man. Additionally, this scouting report also features Kevin Malone, who was not allowed to play in the basketball game, but showed considerable skill in the shoot-around time after the game was over. Second, after Michael clucked at Daryl like a chicken in front of people, the two agreed on a high-stakes wager for the game. The losing team would have to come into work on Saturday. Michael actually suggests this as a bet because corporate has already told him that the office employees have to come in on Saturday and work. Technically speaking, the bet makes no sense. It suggests that corporate needed workers in on a Saturday, but that it didn't matter whether they were office workers or warehouse workers, which is odd given that their jobs are entirely different. Third, each player's section in the scouting report will list age, height, best basketball attribute, worst basketball attribute, game summary, and player summary. The ages listed are actually the ages of the actors who played the characters, not the ages of the characters themselves. Surprisingly, they are not all listed. Mostly, the information included will have been culled from the basketball episode, though that's not always the case. Fourth, as an added bonus, everyone here is listed in reverse order, meaning it goes from the worst player in the game to the best player in the game. Fifth, I lied. Lonnie, Madge, and Jerry do a whole lot of nothing during the game, and also, they aren't primary characters in the show, so they actually aren't included. Everyone else is, though. Lonnie was played by Patrice O'Neill, a comedian who passed away in 2011. There are a few characters who popped up briefly on the show that it would have been cool to see a little more of. O'Neill's Lonnie is one of them. Lonnie makes one jumper early in the game, and the closest either Madge or Jerry get to contributing is that Jerry was the one who accidentally hit Michael in the face near the end of the episode. Michael used it as an excuse to end the game because he knew his team was winning and thought they'd be declared the winners if the game stopped right there. It didn't work, though. Daryl and Roy and Lonnie recognize the cowardice of the move and use it to bully Michael into saying that his team would work on Saturday. I suppose that means you can make an argument that Jerry, in a very roundabout way, actually prevented Daryl's team from losing and was, in fact, the most valuable player. That'd be dumb, though. Michael Scott, age 42, height 5 foot 9, best basketball attribute, endless confidence, worst basketball attribute, actually very bad at basketball. Game summary. The game starts out well enough for Michael. He somehow wins the jump ball against a taller, meaner, beefier Roy. But then everything turns to rotten toothpaste for him after that. These are all of the things that he does in the game, or that happen to him in the game. 1. He gives up what ends up being a wide-open layup for Roy, and he does so because he is so preoccupied with being surprised at how bad Stanley turns out to be at basketball that he forgets to play defense. You don't see the actual shot, only the edges of it in the background. It looks like Roy makes it, though. 2. He gives up a wide-open jumper to Lonnie, which Lonnie drills. 3. He misses a layup, a thing that has to have been especially frustrating for Jim because Jim literally dove out of bounds to knock a loose ball up to Michael under the rim for the layup. This happens in the first few moments of the game, and really, above all else, Jim diving after a loose ball during a pickup game being played on a makeshift court in a warehouse should have been a giant red flashing light that he was not fucking around. 4. He lets Roy, the guy he's supposed to be guarding, get free for another easy layup. 5. He chastises Dwight after Dwight makes a jump shot. He does so because he wanted Dwight to pass it to him, which is even more absurd than it sounds when you peek forward and see that Dwight finished the game shooting 100% from the field 3 for 3, and Michael finishes the game shooting 0% from the field 0 for 5. There's a chance that he actually went 0 for 6 because there's one play where it's hard to tell if he's passing it or shooting it, and not knowing whether <laughs> someone is passing it or shooting it is usually a pretty easy way to tell that someone is not good at basketball. <laughs> 6. As mentioned, he shoots five times during the game, none of which go in, several of which don't even hit the rim, and one of which somehow ends up bouncing off the wall on the second floor of the warehouse. 7. He misses a free throw. 
Right here feels like a good spot to mention how funny it is that Daryl's team somehow fouled Michael's team so many times that everyone decided that they should be in the bonus, which is a thing that has never happened in pickup basketball before. Daryl must have really had his side revved up on some bad boys era Detroit Pistons shit. It should also be mentioned that Michael takes 18 seconds to shoot his free throw, nearly double the amount of time allotted to NBA players when they shoot free throws. Eight. He turns the ball over with a sloppy pass. Nine. He calls for the ball and then forgets he's just called for the ball, resulting in it being thrown out of bounds. Ten. He tries to showboat while dribbling and gets the ball stolen by Roy, who mocks him afterward. Eleven. As mentioned, he tries to end the game early after a foul because he knows his team is ahead and thinks if the game stops right there, then his team will win, but then gets bullied by the other team into accepting defeat. Player summary. He's bad at basketball things. Ryan Howard, age 26, height 5 foot 9, best basketball tribute in good shape. Worst basketball tribute, his commitment to the team is highly questionable. Game summary. In the tiny amount of time we see Ryan in the game, he gets an assist, grabs a rebound, and makes a free throw. And those things together should, by all measurements, equal up to him being a serviceable role player. I'm not sold on him, though. He mostly seemed annoyed that he was being asked to participate, and it also was weird that he brought his basketball stuff to the office in an old plastic bag. Even Jim, who spent just about the entirety of his time at Dunder Mifflin only giving 60% effort, had enough respect to put his stuff in a duffel bag. He feels like a trap. Player summary. Capable, but it seems like he's the kind of player you draft because of his high upside, and then he gets to camp and everyone hates him, and nobody can figure out why he won't just try harder. Stanley Hudson, age 47, height 5 foot 10, best basketball tribute, dribbling, worst basketball tribute, his heart sucks, boom, roasted. Game summary, the only basketball move that Stanley does in the game is dribble, he does so twice, and both times it's wonderful. Player summary, he's not great at basketball, but he's less detrimental to the team than Michael, that's why he finishes higher than him here, and he's more likable than Ryan, that's why he finishes ahead of him. Phyllis Lappin, age 52, height 5 foot 7, best basketball tribute, a wet jumper, worst basketball tribute, don't you dare. Game summary, there are only two moments that we get to see Phyllis actually in the game. For one of them, she's under the rim getting ready to potentially rebound a shot. For the other, she's knocking down a 13 foot pull up. Some might take that to mean that she's not that valuable player or even that good of a player. I'm leaning in the other direction though. I'm taking it to mean that if we take the data we have and stretch it out and then extrapolate a conclusion from it, it means that literally every time you see Phyllis in any basketball game ever, she's either about to rebound a shot or she's scoring, which is incredible. Player summary, Phyllis in basketball, as in all things, remains wildly underrated. Daryl Philbin, age 32, height 6 foot 2. Best basketball tribute, great leadership ability, worst basketball tribute, possibly horrible leadership ability. Game summary. Daryl is the point guard of the team, which makes sense because he's the leader of the team. I'm not certain where to land him, though, because for one side of the argument, he's clearly a great leader. He has special handshakes with Lonnie, and that kind of thing is always great for team morale. He stands up for his team when Michael tries to cheat his way into a declaration of victory. He coaches the team during the game. He is possessed of a great basketball skill. And mostly I'm thinking about how the two shots he makes during the game, a layup and what amounts to a pull-up three in transition, prove that he can play anywhere on the court. But also, for the other side of the argument, he's clearly not that great of a leader. And really the only proof you need is how, despite being the one in charge of the team, he doesn't make any sort of defensive adjustments or changes during the stretch when Jim takes over the game. Player summary. It's a toss-up. You might be getting the 2008 Boston Celtics version of Rajon Rondo, but you also might be getting the 2015 Dallas Mavericks version of Rajon Rondo. Kevin Malone, age 32, height 6 foot 1, best basketball tribute, an extremely wet jumper. Worst basketball tribute, sometimes he doesn't get chosen to play. Game summary. Kevin was not allowed to play in the game. There's no official game summary. What he did do, though, is what people who don't get chosen to play in the game do after the game is finished. He went out on the court and got a few shots up. Player summary. He has no question the best jumper of all the players in the game. Great form, great follow through, great range, great consistency. He goes four for four in the footage of him playing. And Rain Wilson explains in the episode's commentary that he actually hit 14 in a row at one point. It's unclear whether or not he'd be able to create his own shot consistently. I suspect yes, but he's absolutely and for sure a devastating spot up shooter. 
He's their Clay Thompson, I suppose. Roy Anderson, age 30, height 6 foot 4, best basketball attribute, size. Worst basketball attribute, has tremendous trouble defending players who are smitten with his fiance. Game summary. Michael describes Roy as the warehouse team's best player, and for as wrong as Michael is about a lot of basketball-related things, he appears to be right about that. Roy has an imposing physical stature. He's not afraid to bang. He elbows Jim in the face during a post-up, causing him to bleed. He's a good glue guy. There are multiple instances of him celebrating the successes of his teammates. He's not above pettiness. He steals the ball from Michael while Michael is imitating a Harlem Globetrotter and then hums the Globetrotter song as he jogs past Michael back on defense. He's mean. He tells Pam that if she doesn't help his team cheat, he's going to make her sleep in the car. Being mean isn't necessarily a basketball trait, but it's kind of definitely a basketball trait. You know what I'm saying? He's an active defender. He doesn't complain about bad calls. Michael calling a charge on him is maybe the most egregious moment of the entire episode. He's a willing passer, and he's extremely efficient. He finishes the game three for three from the field with every shot coming within a few feet from the basket. Player summary. Or not for Jim slicing him up into a billion tiny pieces. More on this in a moment. Roy would have likely finished with an A1 rating. Since Jim did, though, I don't think it's possible to place Roy any higher than third in this particular discussion. Dwight Schrute, age 39, height 6 foot 2, best basketball attribute, multifaceted, worst basketball attribute, a blind devotion to Michael Scott skews his basketball vision. Game summary, Dwight is possessed of a surprisingly sound all-around game, he has strong defensive instincts, a solid dribble, a commitment to team that supersedes his own interests. There's a part where, after Jim hits a jumper, Dwight tries to celebrate with him. In an airtight mid-range game, what's most impressive, though, is that he shows the same sort of tenacity during the basketball game that he does while executing his duties as Dunder Mifflin's alpha paper salesman. The two best examples. One, he steals the ball from his own teammate Ryan and then scores quickly because he thinks Ryan's taking too long to shoot. I'm reminded of the episode where he steals the big sale from Jim because Jim kept getting interrupted when he was trying to close. And two, he rips the ball out of Madge's hand, scores a layup, and then turns around and talks shit to her. I'm reminded of that episode where he tried to steal Michael's job from him. Player summary. All things being weighed, he's a few steps short of being the type of player you can have as your number one option if you're looking to win a championship, but he can absolutely get the job done as your assistant to the number one option. He's the paper industry's DeMar DeRozan, as it were. Jim Halpert, age 33, height 6 foot 3, best basketball attribute, talented scorer, worst basketball attribute, no discernible weaknesses. Game summary. Immediately prior to the start of the game, there's only one person that Jim decides to talk to, and that's because Jim only had one objective in the game, to commit basketball murder. Michael makes a joke about how if Daryl's team wins the game, then he's going to fire everybody. Nobody laughs. Then Michael says, Okay, let's do it. And he claps his hands and starts stretching. Jim, his chest full of fire and hate, angles his body toward Roy, the fiancé of the woman he's secretly in love with, extends his hand, then says, Have a good game, man. Roy responds in kind, then turns around and hustles away. Jim doesn't move, though. He just stands there. Staring at Roy as Roy joins his team. Because Jim wasn't really telling him to have a good game, Jim was telling him, I'm about to put you in the fucking dirt. And that's exactly what he proceeded to do. Michael was actually the one who was supposed to be guarding Roy, but early on, Roy got loose for a few easy buckets, and so Jim tells Michael to let him guard Roy. It's like when the Dream Team played the Croatian team in the 1992 Olympics, and Michael Jordan demanded he and Scottie Pippen take turns guarding Tony Kukoc. Michael, who calls a timeout, LOL, to settle his team down, agrees. Jim nods to himself, and then he spends the next 75 seconds turning the warehouse basketball court into a crime scene. He attacks the rim on the first play of the timeout and hits a layup over Roy. And when he does so, he makes sure to run by Pam and make a very, that's the guy you're going to marry, face at her. Roy retaliates by elbowing Jim in the nose on the next play. But Jim, now bloodied, only grows more powerful. He takes Roy into the post on the next play, hits him with a LeBron shoulder blast move. 
and then pulls up for a fadeaway over him. Roy tries to bring the ball up the court after that, but Jim is having none of Roy's shit, and so he just snatches it away from him, earning himself a wide-open layup on the other end of the court. Roy is clearly frustrated after the steal, and honestly, how could he not be? He's getting eaten up by a floppy-haired tiger shark in front of his woman and also his friends. After that, he takes Roy down to the post again, this time hitting him with an elbow into the chest that knocks him to the ground. As Roy falls, Jim pulls up, swishing in another jumper on him. And really by this point, the Jim versus Roy matchup starts to feel like that scene in Troy when Brad Pitt kills Hector and then ties his body to the back of his chariot and drags it all through the courtyard in front of the castle for everyone to see. Roy falling down as Jim is rising up is about as obvious of a play on symbolism as it gets, really. There's a moment at the end of the episode where Roy walks into the office to pick up Pam to take her home. As he waits for her to gather her things, he makes a remark in Jim's direction, complimenting him on the game. Pam looks at Jim, smiles a tiny amount, and then says, Yeah, he's uh, he's pretty good, huh? Roy ignores the comment, but Jim, staring at the camera and smiling, grabs a hold of it and presses it against his giant, wonderful, sentimental heart. As Pam and Roy walk out of the office, she makes a flirtatious mention of getting him in a tub at home. Roy, knowing full well that Jim is still within earshot, says back, Yeah. Let's get you in a tub. The smile melts off Jim's face because he knows there's still more killing to be done. Player summary. Tall, strong, skilled, motivated, unstoppable. As I wrote in basketball and other things, when I talked briefly about this, he showed fearlessness, tenacity, intelligence, savvy, a firm allegiance to team, assertiveness, toughness, and a willingness to obliterate a man in front of the woman that he's supposed to marry. Jim Halpert is a winner. No question, he's the best player in the game. He can do it all.